Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Zephron Olive, and it's time for another daily dose of Dominaria spoilers. And today, we actually have quite a bit to talk about. We're out of mythics, but we have some sweet rares, some really interesting tribal stuff at the lower rarity. So let's jump right into it, starting with Ariel Knight of Windgraze, and this card actually seems pretty reasonable, especially if you're in a knight tribal deck, kind of the knight payoff. So, four mana, including white and black, you get a 4-4 four, four legendary creature, human knight with vigilance, then you pay two and a white and tap it to create a 2-2 two, two knight creature token with vigilance, or you can pay one black and tap it, along with X untapped knights you control, to destroy a creature with power X or less. So it's kind of like this army in a can. It's a little bit slow, but it helps make up for that with the fact that it has a 4-4 four, four vigilant body on its own, and if this goes unchecked, the game goes long, I mean, you're in white-black, so you have good removal and whatnot, you can just kind of take over the game, make some knights, make some knights, maybe blow up one of your opponent's best creatures, make some more knights, eventually win the game that way. The reason to be excited for Ariel is kind of twofold. First off, we have a lot of good knights in the standard format. Dauntless Bodyguard, Benelish Marshall, and remember, a lot of the excellent vampires like Vana actually are knights as well, so they can fit into the same deck as Ariel. Also, the 4-drop slot is a little bit weak in the knight tribe, so you can just kind of curve out, maybe play your History of Manalia as kind of a pseudo lord plus knight generator, and use Ariel as just a really good 4-drop finisher in the deck. So, if White Black Knight's are a thing in standard. Pretty sure Ariel will be a part of it. Not sure you can play it as a four of. It is legendary. Maybe a one of, two of, maybe even three of, depending on how good it ends up being. It is slow, so bear that in mind. But the fact it has vigilance, so you can potentially attack and then still use the ability during your opponent's turn to blow up a creature or to make a knight. And remember, there's no sorcery street restriction, so you can do some sweet things on your opponent's turn with Ariel. So I think this card could be pretty reasonable and very good if white black knights become a thing in Dominaria standard. Next on our list, we have Sylvan Awakening. Uh, I don't know about this one. So for three mana, you play a sorcery. Until your next turn, all your lands become 2-2 elemental creature tokens with reach, indestructible, and haste. They are also still land. So kind of got a good news, bad news situation going on. So the bad news of Sylvan Awakening is even though the lands are indestructible, you open yourself up to something like Golden Demise. So if your plan is to Sylvan Awakening, turn your lands into creatures, and not kill your opponent immediately, all of a sudden Golden Demise is just like a one-sided Armageddon that's really, really bad. On the other hand, if you can ramp into this and get a lot of lands on the battlefield, you can deal a lot of damage. You need three lands to actually cast Sylvan Awakening, so they're going to be tapped. But then, if you can have, like, let's say 13 lands on the battlefield altogether, you're going to have 20 power of hasty, indestructible, reaching creatures to go attacking with, can also do some janky stuff with Fall of the Strand, where you play this, and then somehow, while your lands are indestructible, if you have enough mana, cast the Fall of the Thran, make the Armageddon one-sided since your lands are indestructible. So, I think this is a very high-risk, high-reward card. Probably some cool combos and synergies that you can take advantage of with it. Not really expecting it to be, like, a standard staple, but it is better than past versions of this card. The fact that the lands stay creatures until your next turn, so you can use them on defense if you need to. They're also the fact that the lands are indestructible, so you're not getting stone rained by lightning strikes and fatal pushes. Definitely a big upside compared to past versions of the turn your lands into 2 twos cards we've seen. Next on our list, we have some sapperling action, Spore Crown Thalid, and this is basically just a 2 mana lord at uncommon for fungus and sapperling creatures. So, can we make a fungus slash sapperling deck in standard. If we can, Spores Crown Thalid is going to be a big part of it. We have some reasonable payoffs. Tender Shoot Dryad is really powerful if you get Ascend. Slimefoot the Stowaway is basically best friends with Spore Crown Thalid because it's a fungus, so Spore Crown Thalid is going to pump Slimefoot, and then it makes sapperlings, which also are going to be pumped by Spore Crown Thalid. So there might actually be a chance that we could see, I don't 
don't know about a tier one, but a tier two, maybe green, black, fungus slash sapperling deck emerge in standard. Spore Crown Thaled be a big part of it. Also, we have some good token producers. Sprout Swarm is new, another one of our spoilers for today. Making three one ones at instant speed isn't bad, but if you have a Spore Crown Thaled or two and you're making, let's say, three three threes, or maybe you have a Tender Shoot Dryad for even more pumpage, then Sprout Swarm can just be a ton of damage at your opponent's end step by surprise. And then Sampling Migration, pretty reasonable. Two drop, you get the raise the alarm type effect, and then if you manage to kick it, all of a sudden you're getting a ton of tokens for six mana. So there's actually some sweet things going on that makes me think that sapperlings slash fungus can actually be a sweet thing to do in standard and spore crown valid is one of the biggest votes of confidence for this deck we've seen the uncommon two mana lords legion lieutenant being very important to standard they're very important to modern decks and having one in standard for fungus and sapperlings really big deal next up we have another uncommon and this card is actually weirdly scary to me settle the score so it doesn't look like much four mana sorcery exile a creature However, the big deal is you get to put two loyalty counters on a Planeswalker you control, which makes Settle the Score kind of like this weird suspend one pseudo one-shot doubling season effect. So what this card really does, and what makes it scary to me, isn't the fact that it's four mana exile a creature. That's kind of meh at sorcery speed for constructed. The exciting part is it allows you to potentially ultimate Planeswalkers right away. So Jace Cunning Castaway enters with three loyalty. If you can cast a Settle the Score, put two loyalty counters on it it gets up to five your first activation of jace can be the ultimate of course the ultimate just gives you two more jaces but you can do the same thing with tezzeret the schemer cast tezzeret cast settle the score to exile something ultimate start making those five fives liliana can wrath the board right away but take for example chandra torture defiance you don't get to ultimate the first turn but something like chandra plus Chandra, next turn you untap, settle the score or something, ultimate Chandra, that is a pretty unbeatable and really fast way to jump the curve on ultimating your Chandra, and you could do the same thing with some powerful stuff in the modern format as well, something like Liliana on turn three, tick it up on turn four, settle the score, ultimate Liliana, Liliana of the Dark Realms, ultimates quickly as well, Soar and Lord of Innistrad, so I think that that's where this card fits. It's sort of this weird, one-shot, budget version of doubling season. You're exiling a creature, which is fine, you don't mind doing that, but it's almost like a cost. It's like, there has to be a creature on the battlefield for you to take advantage of it. The reason you play this card is because you can build around it to jump the curve on those loyalty counters, ultimate your Planeswalkers a little bit quicker, and hopefully use that ultimate to take over the game, and we just haven't seen this effect before. Just adding loyalty counters willy-nilly isn't something Wizards has done before, so it's going to be interesting to see if anything scary develops with this card. I expect, if you're playing a lot of Planeswalkers, this card is sneakily good. Like, you might play this over Vraska's Contempt, even though it's very much worse as a removal spell, if you have some good Planeswalker synergies, because two loyalty counters, when you think about how most Planeswalkers plus one a lot of the time, that's two extra turns of plus you're getting out of the way working towards that ultimate which is really really powerful Next up, we have one of my favorite cards from the entire set, Lich's Mastery, 6 mana, legendary enchantment, and we got a lot going on here. Hexproof, which is good, because you can't lose the game, except if Lich's Mastery leaves the battlefield, you do lose the game. So, you live as long as Lich's Mastery sticks around, but if it ever goes away, all of a sudden, everything falls apart and you die in the spot. As far as abilities, whenever you gain life, you get to draw that many cards, so you gain 5 life, you you draw five cards. However, whenever you lose life, for each one life that you lose, you have to exile a permanent you control or a card from your hand or your graveyard. So what do you do with Lich's Mastery? And I think it's like this crazy card advantage engine. So you cast this on six, you cast Approach of the Second Sun on turn seven. All of a sudden, you draw seven cards from the life gain, which happens to draw you back into Approach of the Second Sun to win the game. Even something like Cloud Blazer becomes really crazy with a Lich's Mastery out. You're able to draw four cards and 
can't have a Cloud Blazer left behind her. Like, Zakama can go to town with the Game 3 life. It's just repeatable, pay three mana, draw three cards. So you make all this card advantage, maybe throw in Nezahal or Tishana or something. Not because they're great in this deck, but because they make it so you have no maximum hand size, so you're not going to have to discard all the cards you're drawing, which would be a really real concern. Although, if you draw a ton of cards, you're discarding a ton of cards, which means you have cards in your graveyard to exile as you take damage, and then you figure out a way to win the game eventually. You can also kind of break the card a bit by focusing on getting cards in your graveyard. That's the easiest way to pay that damage card. Strategic plannings, even explore creatures like Jade Light Ranger or milling yourself can give you those cards in the graveyard to eat away as you do take damage because that's how you lose the game. And that's the risk of Lich's Mastery is it is a permanent itself. So once your graveyard is empty and your hand is empty and you take damage and you have no other permanents, you're going to have to exile the Lich's Mastery, which means you just die. There's nothing you can actually do about that because you will be forced to exile it to itself. So I don't know of any specific combo. To me, this seems like a ridiculous card advantage engine if you build around it, but it also comes with the risk. If things go wrong and your opponent finds a way to remove it, which I'm not sure there's a way in standard to remove a hexproof enchantment at the moment, but worth keeping the eye out. That would make the card a lot worse if there was a second enchantment, like a Dromoka's Command or something, that could just blow you out and make you lose the game on the spot, but potentially it'll be a ridiculous, insane card advantage engine. If you build around it, hopefully you can use those cards to win the game before Lich's Mastery gets to you. Next up, we have Thran Temporal Gateway, which is basically a twist on Quicksilver Amulet. So Quicksilver Amulet lets you cast it for four mana, pay four, put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. Thran Temporal Gateway, basically the same, except it's for historic permanence, which means not only can you put legendary creatures on the battlefield, you can put any artifact on the battlefield, or a saga, or any type of legendary permanent. So you lose some and you gain some. You can't put a non legendary creature on the battlefield, like a Primeval Titan, for example, but you gain all these weird creature types that you can put into play. So, the exciting part about this card is you could do things that you can't do with Quicksilver Amulet, like Fall of Thran at instant speed is pretty sweet. Wait till your opponent's turn, blow up all their lands, you get to get the lands back on your turn, or some of the other sagas can do sweet things as well. Also a way for casual decks, or maybe even weird modern decks, to jump the curve on Planeswalkers, like cast this, maybe on turn three by ramping into it, turn four, activate it, put a Nicole Bolas or a Ugin the Spirit Dragon into play. Seems pretty powerful, and that's something that Quicksilver Amulet can't do. Also worth mentioning, we have some really big legendary creatures in standard. Tishana, Razakaz, Sakamas, and all these cards are pretty powerful if you're essentially playing them for four mana, and then if you're drawing cards, tutoring with Razakath, all that stuff, you could just keep doing it. The next turn, like you draw a bunch of cards, put something else into play the next turn. Razakath, tutor up what you want to put into play and do it again for just four mana. So maybe we could do some sweet things in standard with it as well. Also worth mentioning, legendary permanence means that this is a weird form of ramp. Not so much in standard, where we only have an inventor's fair as a legendary land, but you can just put extra lands into play, which in modern or commander means Nykthos is, a Boros. There's a lot of legendary lands in existence. We just don't have that many in standard. So the fact that it's really bad ramp, but still being ramp is kind of nice for some decks. Like breaking the one land per turn rule can be beneficial if you're playing like a mono blue deck or another deck that doesn't really have much ramp in standard or in brawl. So through a temporal gateway, I'm excited to see what people do with this card. I don't think it's going to be incredibly busted, especially right away in a world where we have a braid and main decks in standard, but it's a super fun build around. It does things that we've just never been able to do before, like slamming planeswalkers into play at instant speed or weird non-creature legends. So I think it'll do some really sweet things. It'd be super fun to build around. Just how competitive it'll be, that remains to be seen, but a really cool card nonetheless. Next on our list, we have the Mending of Dominaria, our green rare saga, and this card, meh, I mean, it's kinda cool. So basically, you put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard for the first and second lore counter, and as you do that, you get to return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So it's kinda like Liliana the Last Hope's negative two ability. So it's not bad, hopefully you're drawing cards, especially if you're in a deck that's built around it. Then you get to return all land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. So 
it's kind of the mass Landry animation as well, which makes it kind of this split card of Lily out of the last hope and Splendid Reclamation, which I don't know exactly what you do with that. I was excited for Splendid Reclamation, never really figured out a way to break it. Lily out of the last hope is good, but it's good because you can do other things as well. Also, the Mending of Dominaria is five mana, so it's kind of a lot. It is kind of an army in a can, like the cards you mill over, probably some lands in there to get back on the battlefield. If you build around it, maybe you can go really crazy. It is worth pointing out that for standard, we went from having like zero mass land reanimation spells in all of magic to having one pretty much every set. So we have right now World Shaper and the Mending of Dominaria. So if you can figure out a way to break the mass land reanimation effect or build a deck around it, there is a lot of redundancy. Like we have eight copies of a card that can reanimate all your lands with four Mending of Dominarias, four World Shapers. So that makes it a little more appealing to build around that you have redundancy with what would probably be the key effect for your deck. So I don't know how to break this. I think it's a fun card, a fun value-y card, and maybe there's some land reanimation combo out there that could really make it even more competitive. Rounding things out today, we have a few more lower rarity cards. Garna the Blood Flame is another one of what seems to be a sub-theme of Dominaria. Five mana, three, three legendary creatures. Good news is, this one is actually pretty interesting. So, for five mana, you get the three, three with flash. Also gives all your other creatures haste, but the big deal is, when when it enters a battlefield, you get to return all creatures that were put into your grave card from anywhere this turn to your hand, which is actually pretty interesting. We've seen effects like this that put all creatures that went from the battlefield to your hand and so forth, but this one has a lot more breakability because of how it's worded. So, obviously, the simplest way to think of this is you play your Glorybringers and your Earthshaker Kenras, whatever random creatures, your opponent fumigates you and you're like, haha, I got Garna, I'm gonna get back all my creatures, I fizzled your fumigate essentially, and then you have a Garna, which gives your stuff haste so you can reassemble really quickly and get in big chunks of damage after a but because it's creatures from anywhere, you could do some weird things like glimpse the unthinkable yourself and hopefully mill over like five or six creatures, play Garna, and turn into like a huge card draw spell. You can dredge cards into your graveyard with Stinkweed Imp and then play your Garna, get back all the creatures you dredged over. So the fact that it's from anywhere really opens up some sweet possibilities. In standard, probably the sweetest thing is using something like Skirk Prospector in Goblins to like pseudo combo. Off. So you're getting down your Siege Gang Commanders, you're sacking all your goblins to make a bunch of mana, then you play your Garna, get them all back again, maybe recast them, and build like this Goblin Storm deck. The problem is I don't know what the payoff is. There's so many things that would be sweet and standard if we had a Blood Artist in the format or something like that. So I don't know the payoff for this, but you can definitely do some pseudo combo-ish things with Garna that are pretty sweet. You can also just build Aristocrats, which again, we're missing the sweet Blood Artist style payoff, but you got your Ani is a sack outlet, Doom to Center, Alenda, kind of a payoff-ish for sacking. Not a Blood Artist, but something at least. So you do all your sacking, then get everything back, sack it all over again. So there's definitely some super sweet potential for Garna to do some really cool things. And it's a card I'm really excited to build around. I'm hoping that we get the right pieces, like a Blood Artist in the future, to really push it over the top. Next up, we have Whisper Blood Liturgist, which is another interesting legend. So, four mana, you get a 2-2. Two -two. You get to sack two creatures to return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So, the downside of this one is it dies to a lot. Shocks and Magma Sprays, two toughness, not a super competitive cost on it. The upside is you can do some sweet things. We have cards that come back from the graveyard, like Scrap Heap Scrounger. So, you can, like, reanimate your Razaketh or something, sacking cards that are going to come back anyway. You can also do some really sweet things with cards that make tokens, like Siege Gang Commander, Angel of Invention, Marionette Master, because you can sacrifice, let's say, Marionette Master plus one of the servos to get back another Marionette Master or any random creature. Then the next turn, you can sacrifice a servo and the random creature, more servos to get back the Marionette Master to make even more creatures. So you're actually, like, netting creatures in that exchange as you go through the loop. If you go to Modern and can throw Intruder Alarm into the mix, 
that's where you can just go straight up infinite. So you have a true to alarm, you have Whisper Blood Liturgist, you get down a Marionette Master, a Siege Gang Commander, whatever, you tap it, sacrifice Siege Gang and the token, let's say, get back something from your graveyard, that's going to untap your Whisperer, so then you can sacrifice a couple of other creatures, get back Siege Gang to make even more creatures, and the result is you can just go infinite. If it's Marionette Master instead of Siege Gang Commander, you're draining the opponent out of the game as well. So I'm mostly excited about this, is a fun, casual card for Commander, and a potential jank combo piece in Modern. As far as Standard goes, I think we have better reanimation, so I would be surprised if it showed up in competitive decks in Standard, unless a specific combo develops. Like, when Marionette Master, if they reprint Intruder Alarm, or some other way that you can really go nuts with untapping Whisper Blood Liturgist, then it could be very powerful, but as it is, a little bit too fragile to just jam in your decks, because it dies to too many things. Finally, couple more lore rarity cards. In Bolus' Clutches, meh, steals anything for six mana. We've seen this before with, like, Volition Reigns. This one's legendary. It turns a permanent into legendary permanent. I don't think this is actually very good. We did see Volition Reigns occasionally be a sideboard card for control decks, so maybe In Bolus' Clutches could be a sideboard card as well. It does hit any permanent, so you can steal a land with it if you really want to. And then Gaia's Protector, just 100% limited fodder. No chance this shows up in standard in any way, shape, or form. Anyway, those have been our daily Dominaria spoilers for today. So, what do you think of these cards? How good is our new knight? Ariel. Is that going to show up in competitive standard decks? Is Sylvan Awakening better than I'm giving it credit for, or is it just too risky because of Golden Demise and other removal? Can Saperling slash Fungus Tribal actually be a thing? How risky is Settle the Score? Is that going to break something? Is there a chance that those two loyalty counters are really going to push it over the top? What about Lich's Mastery? Are there any specific combos, or is it just a huge card advantage engine? What do you want to put into play with Thren's Temporal Gateway? How about the Mending of Dominarium I missing anything there? The lower rarity cards, our Garnas, our Whisper Blood Liturgists. What else can you do with them? Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.